um, webinar, 29th of July, 2021, tax tips for company directors. Uh, but quite a few slides. Uh, so without further ado, uh, about this webinar, uh, tax centric talk, no surprises there, to cover, right, some considerations on incorporating your business, getting the most out of your company as director shareholder, all of these uh, examples and things that we will consider over the next uh, sort of roughly hour, uh, will assume that you are both a director and a shareholder, so you're able to draw a salary, uh, able to take benefits in kind, and also to take dividends as an alternative. If you're a part owner of the company, or at least a part owner of the company, probably 100% uh, owner of the company, as well as being an employee stroke officer thereof. We'll also talk about um, uh, exiting the company, company sale, you know, uh, the, the end of life considerations, if you will. Um, so, broken down to three stages uh, in the beginning incorporation some considerations on incorporating a business first of all remind me why we want to incorporate a quick recap and how we might want to incorporate in the first place is it a share exchange or an asset sale or maybe something else and then don't forget some of the sort of general housekeeping that is uh, part of incorporation don't let the the little things trip you up now, why incorporate? Uh, there are some very good non-tax reasons for incorporating uh, your business. Probably the most obvious and most important being limited liability protection. It's quite valuable if you operate in, in high-risk areas such as construction um, or you hold cherished assets. I emphasize outside the company. <laughs> I have occasionally come across people who think that uh, <laughs> the assets are protected by being in a company which is trading that, that I think that's not quite the right uh, way to approach things generally you want to keep the um, cherished assets outside of the company which is exposed uh, by reference to trading or other business activity and it can be more reassuring to potential clients and customers to be dealing with a limited company uh, it perhaps uh, has more gravitas now tax reasons which is really my area of uh, expertise Trading and professions, if you're exposed to class two, class four and ICs, then uh, you typically have a lower tax and an ICs cost to get profits out of a company and into your hands than when self-employed. But it will depend on the level of profits versus how much you actually need. Um, there are now, as we, as we sort of move towards 2023 and higher corporation tax rates, there are some sort of uh, areas where uh, being in a company could be more expensive, and we'll look at that in a sec. Property businesses, generally speaking, sort of year on year, not much impetus to incorporate an, an ordinary lettings business, except where remaining unincorporated means exposure to a significant uh, a tax restriction of mortgage interest, etc., because of residential letting. That, I think, is the key uh, driver for people wanting to incorporate their business when they have a residential buy to let business and they are getting hammered for uh, the restriction of um, mortgage interest relief and related costs. The third option is where you can afford not to take out all of the business profits. So your annual tax on profits is, is taxed, uh, it's corporation tax instead of income tax. And corporation tax today, 19% in the vast majority of cases could be playing 45% plus from an income tax perspective. If you can afford to leave some, all, somewhere in between, um, of your profits in the company where they've only paid 19%, then clearly you will end up with more uh, reserves, more, more funds to play around with if you just leave it in the corporate wrapper, you don't need to take it out and suffer a further amount of income tax to, to do so. Now, should traders incorporate? It took me a long while to get these. Uh, <laughs> it may not be obvious to you, but it, it took me quite a while to get these uh, charts in, in, a present, in a presentable form. So you're getting them again. Some of you may recognize these from uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, just to recap very quickly, um, 
Uh, remind me how these work now. Yes. Okay. So uh, good old days, uh, 2015, 16, before the uh, new rules for dividends came in, uh, that dotted line, the blue dotted line at the top, said it was all good incorporating at any level of profits you would theoretically have a, 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 a you know a lower tax cost it became a little bit more constrained uh under the new regime when uh dividend income started to be taxed more more punitively uh now that and that's the blue dashed line now that we are contemplating 23 april 2023 onwards uh, more restrictive corporation tax cost, then you can start to see uh, a significant uh, curtailment of the benefit uh, in, in terms of extracting all of your uh, profits from the business, primarily a salary in the first, in the first place up to about 9,000 and then the balance uh, in dividends. Look at how quickly it starts to fall uh, off as uh, rates, uh, profitability increases that's something to look forward to in a couple of years. I emphasize that we're talking here about uh, an individual who's running a, a self-employed business, 100% um, shareholder, and taking out all the profits in the year that they arise, just for simplicity. Uh, contrast that with 100% um, uh, owner of a buy-to-let business. This is a residential property letting business. And uh, the blue dotted line this time says how we were before uh, the interest relief restriction came in. Um, the blue dashed line shows uh, roughly how we are right now. If I am paying 50% uh, of my uh, net profits away uh, as uh, interest, so let's say, for example, that I have uh, net profits of £4,000 after £4,000 worth of interest cost, net profits of £8,000 after £8,000 of interest cost. So quite a significant amount of interest. Um, you're clearly advantaged by being in a company wrapper. That is going to take a hit. The orange line shows what the scenario is going to be from 2023 onwards. So that's gone closer to zero. The, the, the extent of the benefit is very much dependent on how much interest uh, is exposed to the new restriction for dwelling related loans and, and finance. So just to recap, the impending 2023 corporation tax, right, corporation tax rate hike for profits above 50K means that for self-employed people contemplating incorporation, there are still potentially significant savings in a relatively narrow profit band now, say 50,000 to 70,000 uh, pounds a profit per year, um, which is not to say that it's not marginally advantageous uh, at other rates of profit, but that is really the, what you might hesitate to use the phrase sweet spot, but you know, let, let's use it for now. But do beware that if you're taking profits of around 130,000 a year, which I accept is, is, it would be a good result for many people, incorporation may cost and it may start to cost a lot. Um, property businesses, again, highly dependent on the extent to which your lettings business is exposed to the um, new interest relief restriction. Uh, that will do for there. The, the only other thing to add really is that these rates and bands are very much dependent on whether or not you have you own one company or several and whether you're a, a singleton shareholder 100 shareholder or maybe going 50 50 or a third a third a third etc with other shareholders those rates those bands this the sweet spot uh, may well change accordingly so we're going to look now at how to incorporate. Um, I'm going to look at, do you sell your business to your new company for real proceeds, real money? Uh, do you exchange your business for shares issued in your company? Or do you maybe consider just setting up a new company alongside your existing business, which may be in, in, the, in the same field? 
selling your business to your company. This was very popular back in the good old days before um, George had a punt at uh, uh, Entrepreneurs Relief on incorporating business. So the, the concept here is you'll be exposed to capital gains tax because you are selling your business, uh, even though it's your company. Uh, the sale must be at open market value, whether you're not like or not, because it's connected parties. Ignoring residential property, uh, the maximum rate is going to be 20%. With residential property, the, 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 the rate of CGT could be as high as 28%. Note that uh, the 10%, the reason why it used to be favoured this route, um, is that you would have paid 10% in the good old days before uh, 3rd of the 12th, 2015, um, on incorporating your recognised personal goodwill, um, even though HMRC says you can't have, there's no such thing as personal goodwill according to HMRC. Thankfully, the tribunals disagree. Uh, company may not have the cash to physically pay you, because it's a brand new company normally, it may not have the, the funds, so you can leave the balance outstanding on loan account. And one of the reasons why this was so popular is that um, you would sort of sell your business in for you know, full market value. And then over the next several years, the company would owe you 200 grand, 500 grand, a million pounds, whatever it might be. And you could take that money from the company out of the, the profits that it was then generating. And that would be tax free. And that was brilliant um, for an effective sort of 10% tax charge on the way in. Note that this route is less popular, as I've alluded to uh, already, but you can keep some assets back if you want to retain them personally. And you need to contrast this with the next route, which is to, instead of a sort of formal sale, is to exchange uh, your business formally in, ex in exchange for uh, the shares. So it, it, there's no monetary value being described to uh, uh, the, the business at this point. Uh, it's not a conventional sale. It is a swap of shares for the business. That means that there's still capital gain tax, but it's held that the, the capital gain, instead of being triggered there and then, is held over into the shares. So you need to be careful. You need to recognize that those shares will be um, holding quite a bit of gain in them when you sell them at a later date or you give them away the CGT is still charged one gift. If you that later give them away, except to your spouse or some partner, um, then there will be a CGT uh, hit to consider. With incorporation relief, all assets bar cash must be transferred into your company. You cannot retain uh, per, you know, cherished assets personally. And there's no tax-free pot to draw down on over the years to come. But then there's no immediate CGT bill either. So it's kind of, uh, horses for courses. Run a company alongside. It's possible in some cases, set up a new company and for it to carry on a similar but separate activity to your personal business. Now, that means, for example, if you're in uh, construction, there's no reason why you can't carry on doing some construction work personally and then set up a company to do construction work as well, particularly if there's a, uh, an especially uh, risky uh, a project that you want to be protected from in case it all goes bad. Um, also, if you want to shelter some of your profits where you don't need to take all those profits, you, you, you're generating more profit than you actually personally need, so you can allow it to roll up uh, in, in the company. Um, obviously, if that new activity needs expensive assets to start with, then that could be problematic. And Obviously, with a, with a property business, that's particularly problematic. You need a lot of a lot of bricks and mortar to start with a property business. Um, can it run separate clients or customers? One, one issue to bear in mind here is VAT and, and what they call the disaggregation um, anti-avoidance measures. However, they almost never uh, act retrospectively. Finally, uh, keep in mind that uh, there are lots of sort of what I would call housekeeping issues and pitfalls to consider on incorporation. Once you've decided it's, it works for you and it's the right step to, to make, um, you know, HMRC may try to increase the capital gains tax charge by saying uh, the business is worth more than you think it is. Obviously, if you're going route one and, and, and you want to uh, minimize your CGT exposure um, by making, uh, you know, you're making a, a formal sale for proceeds, uh, HMRC could come along and say, well, actually, your business is worth a lot more than you, than you say it is, and we want a, a bigger capital gains tax uh, take. 
That would be ironic and somewhat hypocritical given their previous uh, uh, contentions, but uh, it could happen. Asset light businesses have a different problem to consider or another problem to consider, which is uh, that HMRC likes to wheel out sale of occupational income or uh, sale of income regi uh, anti-avoidance regimes. Argue that what you would consider to be a sale of your business subject to CGT instead is a, is a, is a is a sale of income rights, a sale of income, um, and therefore taxable at the income tax rates. Don't forget capital allowances. Just because a pool has nil value doesn't mean that there aren't uh, capital allowances implications. Um, SDLT, stamp duty land tax, is uh, applicable. Um, your mileage may vary in other jurisdictions, of course, in Scotland or Wales these days. Um, if there's real estate to be to be punted into the into the uh, company. There's VAT, is it a transfer of a going concern or not? And there are IHT implications if there are other shareholders, particularly if your estate is uh, affected by the transfer in. Let's say, for example, this wouldn't be normal, but let's say, for example, that um, the uh, company is split with other shareholders, maybe in your family, and therefore effectively, you've gone from earning 100% of the original uh, self-employed business uh, into being a 70% shareholder in, in, in the uh, company, uh, you've obviously lost some wealth by doing so and, and some wealth has moved out of your estate which would have an, an inheritance tax uh, consequence. A sort of the second stage really, uh, reward efficiency. This could be considered as an imperative, reward efficiency, or it could also be considered as how do we reward efficiency? or how do we efficiently reward people? Um, in this section, we shall look at alphabet shares. Um, are they good or bad? Settlements anti-avoidance legislation. Uh, the fundamentals, again, don't let the housekeeping trick you up, or, or maximize the benefit of all the, the various tax, uh, tax favored benefits in kind that are out there. Loan accounts, it's a, a, we're gonna walk you through uh, an example. And then timing is everything, or a lot of things. Paying dividends using alphabet shares. Um, the problem with shares is that, generally speaking, if you have several shareholders in a company and they all have 25% or 25 of the 100 shares in issue or uh, 500 of the 1,000 shares in issue, um, then they're all going to be entitled to the same dividend. The dividend is normally quoted as £100 per share. £200 per share, £1,000 per share. But what if you don't want that amount of shares? You know, what, what do you do if actually you want fewer shares and fewer dividends to, uh, than, you, than to which you were entitled? Um, you know, maybe that doesn't suit you. Maybe you don't want a, a massive income tax bill. Uh, maybe you just don't need that amount of income. Uh, the, the traditional approach in, in those circumstances is to say, okay, well, I'll, I'll do a dividend waiver or, or we will agree to do a dividend waiver. Um, and that means I will reduce my entitlement to shares going forward. And that, that dividend waiver normally applies for the balance of the accounting period, let's say. Um, it's problematic for various reasons. Dividend waivers have frequently tripped up small businesses, small companies. Um, in, in the paperwork. An alternative, which is relatively straightforward, is alphabet shares. You know, so Audrey has 25 ordinary A shares, Bernice has uh, 40 ordinary B shares, Cynthia has ordinary you know, 15 ordinary C shares, Derek, whatever, you obviously you, know, you can take whatever name you like. Um, in this scenario, assuming that the, the shares rank pari per of course, are equal rights to uh, the dividends, it's just that they are sort of segmented or stratified into a separate partition. Audrey can have a dividend of £10 per share. Benice may take £15 per share. Cynthia might decide to take none. And this is much more flexible. It doesn't require you to start uh, raising loads of dividend waiver paperwork. And it means that you can flex from one month to the next, one quarter to the next, without sort of having to recant all the dividend waivers that you've already done. Now, can HMRC 
in some cases still use the settlements anti-avoidance legislation to say that Cynthia has, by saying I don't want any dividends this, uh, you know, this quarter or this month, is she effectively settling her income rights on Audrey and Bernice? She said, I don't want it, you have it instead. Well, because the settlements legislation would allow XMRC to say, Cynthia, it's your cash and we're going to tax you on it. And, and, and you, know, you can't give it to Audrey and Bernice. Uh, or for tax purposes, it's taxed on you and, and not on them. Uh, the answer is that yes, it is a settlement, but no, it's not caught. There's a lot of confusion here. And I, I sat in front of a room full of solicitors and, and they've argued till they're blue in the face. HMRC's guidance is there in black and white. HMRC accepts that Cynthia is not, it might be a settlement, but it's not caught by the settlement's anti-avoidance legislation so as to make it the, the income forfeited uh, being taxable on her so long as she, her spouse or civil partner or her minor children do not actually benefit from the income she has given away. Now, I'm assuming the other shareholders are actually already her spouse, her civil partner or so she's not actually giving away in their favour right now. If you're in doubt, read uh, the Trust and Estates Manual 4220, 4225, 4320. Again, you know, the, the manuals are not uh, sort of legally binding. Uh, they're not the law. Uh, they don't necessarily accurately reflect, reflect all aspects of uh, previous cases, but it, that, that they show HMRC's sort of current thinking and, and, and position. And of course, we, we, we'd sort of take quite, we, we'd take umbrage if they were to sort of change their mind, which they occasionally do, let's be fair. Looking at the fundamentals, we're gonna look at salary versus dividends, um, using family members, exploiting family members in the business, and uh, useful tax favored benefits in kind. I went through this in quite a bit of detail in the previous uh, webinar, I don't know if you remember that that far back or like me are traumatized to think about it, but um, not gonna go into it in, in too much detail. Again, some of you may be relieved. Traditionally and very broadly, if the director shareholder has no other taxable income and needs all or most of the company's profits for his or her private use, then for many years, the approach has been say, pay a modest salary of around six, seven, eight, nine thousand to get yourself a national insurance contributions credit for state pension purposes and whatever, uh, and then take the balance as dividends. And that, that's, that's applied for well over a decade. The new higher corporate tax rates from April 2023 mean that it is no longer as you know, cut dried as that. And in some cases, particularly where your company is in the marginal rate band, uh, which will be from 50,000 to 250,000, I think, level of profits per year, then the marginal rate band 26.5% is gonna make it actually cheaper to pay, uh, or, or that the company will have more funds uh, to pay a higher bonus that will end up with you uh, having more money at the end of the day. Um, the other aspect to bear in mind here is that dividends are only payable or payable only when the company actually has sufficient distributive reserves, and we assume always that we have a choice. Can we pay a salary, a bonus, or, you know, can we, can we pay a dividend? Well, actually, a lot of businesses have been hurt quite badly by the pandemic, and they, they may have made significant losses, and dividends are no longer on the table. So um, don't make uh, dividends, that you can't pay out dividends that, that you don't have the distributable profits to be able to do so. Um, you need to check, and it's a director's responsibility to ensure that uh, the company has sufficient reserves to, to make a, a distribution. Dividend payment. Uh, family planning. Can be tax efficient, paying salaries to spouses, civil partners, and even preferably adult children uh, to potentially reduce tax costs. Simple example for the current tax year. You know, if you have the opportunity, if the company's sort of sitting there saying, well, I can pay one person £80,000 or I can pay two people £40,000, um, if the sort of person receiving £80,000 gross would actually get 55k, 55000 assume they had no income, uh, pension contribution or anything like that. If instead, 
director plus spouse, civil partner, uh, director plus adult daughter or son, uh, took 40,000 each. Uh, the directors would each get 31,000. And the company would also save some national insurance contributions. So overall, the, the sort of efficiency would be a, a £7,000 improvement. But do bear in mind that the salary must be commercially justified. Um, you know, you can't sort of pay a salary of, of 40, 50 grand to somebody who only does a day, uh, a day's filing a week or something like that. That, that would be considered to be um, excessive, it wouldn't be allowed uh, as, a, as a deductible, uh, as a deduction in the, in the company, or that excess would not be allowed. Um, uh, and it could, in some cases, be considered to be a distribution in, in favour of the, of the main director shareholder. Also consider pension contributions, because they're very tax efficient most of the time. And if you're uh, not too stingy and happy to give shares to your family members, then you, know, you could consider salary and dividends, or all three. Okay, we're going to sweat the small stuff. Um, useful benefits in kind. Again, went through that in quite a bit of detail um, in the previous seminar. So mobile phones, provision of a mobile phone per, you know, you can, you can provide one mobile phone to an employee, to each employee or, or officer of the company, um, and they can use it privately and there are no restrictions um, and there's no benefit in kind, pension payments, uh, there's no benefit in kind on those. We are in, in, in a place at the moment, certainly, where it's perfectly acceptable for the company to pay any of its employees uh, six pounds a week, I think, to work from home. Um, mileage, traveling, meals and overnight expenses. There's a lot of uh, good stuff that can be uh, taken from the various provisions in that regard. Um, Personal incidental expenses or overnight expenses are now called uh, five pounds a, a night, not taxable, not nickable. Um, Christmas parties and annual staff dues up to 150 pounds per head, not per employee, per head attending. Um, get to know your partners and spouse and civil, you know, civil partners. Um, trivial benefits up to 50 pounds a time. I think I mentioned last time, just be careful, HMRC started to get it into its little mind that um, they should be trying to link all these individual benefits up uh, to, to make it bigger than 50 quid and therefore be successful as a benefit in kind. And in particular, directors need to be conscious of the fact that they are sort of capped at 300 quid ex explicitly. Uh, so they can have no more than six uh, of these 50 pound trivial benefits uh, in, in a year, if the math works. Life insurance, relevant life policies in, in all but a very few favoured circumstances, uh, pensions being the obvious one, um, cycle to work schemes being a rather less obvious one. You need to be careful about salary sacrifice um, and don't offer yourself a cash alternative to the benefit in kind that you sort of say, do you want this benefit in kind? Yes, I like this benefit in kind. Would you want a mobile phone? Yeah, I'll be all right with a mobile phone. Or do you want a thousand pounds? Don't do that. Don't offer, don't offer a cash alternative. It's a bad idea. HMRC calls them optional remuneration arrangements and the legislation now allows them to um, uh, assess whichever would give them the most tax, the cash or the actual benefit. Okay, so let's just quickly go through some useful benefits in kind and just give you a sense of the, of the numbers here to, to sort of make the point that they are worthwhile, they're worth having. Uh, David and Ziggy, 50-50 direct shareholders and the only employees of their companies. That's really nice and simple. It provides the following perks. Mobile telephone, available for private use, no taxable benefit. I say that the contract is £75 a, a month for each, uh, each phone. Sandwich lunch. There's a canteen benefit in kind, a tax favoured benefit in kind, with provision of canteen facilities. And that could be for a small a uh, company with a couple of employees, uh, you know, just sandwich, uh, you know, pack of crisps, whatever it might be. Every day in the office, 20 pounds per week, let's say. If you toss all that up, it comes to just shy of 4,000 pounds per year. The company will get tax relief on these benefits in kind. Uh, so the actual cost of the company is only three grand or just over 3,000 pounds after corporation tax relief. 
that it's not a huge sum. But just bear in mind that if Alex and Ziggy uh, were sort of higher rate taxpayers, they would personally have to use 3,000 gross dividend income each per year to cover those costs personally. So why not get the company to do it? It actually costs almost half in the company as it would to do that personally out of your own back pocket effectively. Loan accounts. We're going to start off with the, the, the good part of loan accounts. I, and I have covered these uh, before, but um, they are useful and common, almost whether you like it or not. Um, very many people who are used to running their own business are used to using uh, the business's funds for their private purposes. So it happens. Nice and early in the tax year, and also coincidentally the accounting year, Eva borrows £50,000 interest-free, which is the norm, from her own company's available funds for private use. The company doesn't care what it's for. I say for private use because actually there, there are some rare scenarios where the no benefit in kind is triggered. She's already a 40% taxpayer. Uh, we, the company has a 31st of March year end, so I think nicely and neatly aligns. In 2021-22, Eva has a cheap loan, benefit in kind. We'll save for the full year. There will be people out there, oh, alternate precise method. Um, let's say it's for the full 12 tax months, for simplicity. 50 grand. The official annual interest rate uh, this year is 2%. So the sort of notional interest that should have been charged is a thousand pounds. And Eva has to pay 40% tax. So she's charged to 400 quid. So my math tells me that borrowing 50,000 pounds costs Eva 400 pounds per year in income tax. Not a lot. The company also suffers class 1A national insurance of about 45 pounds per annum after the corporation tax rate. Now, do bear in mind, that the official interest rate, that 2% that HMRC says, you know, in theory, that would have been what you've been charged on, on, you know, on the high street. Uh, so that, that's what we're going to say is, is the benefit in kind that you've had from getting it interest free. Um, that 2% that could go back up and it's actually very low at the moment. It has been significantly higher, but it does reflect the prevailing market rate, give or take. So in other words, if it's going up here, it's because it's going up in the real world as well. The not so good thing about uh, director's loans is because Eva is also a shareholder, uh, she's therefore, therefore a participator in what we uh, know as a close company because she's the, uh, the totally, she owns 100% of the shares. There is a temporary section, for, I emphasize temporary section 455 tax charge. It's a temporary charge. You effectively, the company has to deposit corporation tax temporarily with HMRC and it can get it back once Eva has repaid the loan or the company has decided to write the loan off. If the loan has not been repaid nine months after the company's year end, which also happens to be when the corporation tax is due, for smaller companies at least. So in this case, basically the end of December 2022. So that loan was made 10th of April 2021. We don't really have to worry too much about this loan until December 2022. That's a good long while. The company has to find 32.5% of the balance that has not yet been repaid. Let's assume either hasn't repaid uh, a cent or a penny. Uh, the section 455 tax charge is 16,250. HMRC then has to repay in proportion to any later repayments that are made after that date of December, 20, or end of December, 1st of January, 2023, technically. Uh, basically nine months after the account share of repayment. So what you kind of get end up in the scenario where if you do have to pay section, if the company does have to pay section 455 tax, HMRC is going to sit on that cash for at least one year to three, et cetera, before it, you know, it, it effectively, on the anniversary that it's due, HMRC may have to pay some back, uh, depending on you know, how long it takes for, for some of that or all of that loan to be either repaid or partly repaid, partly written off, whatever you decide to do. 
this is not a problem for cash rich companies. The only problem is you have to you have to remember to reclaim it at the end. You know, you do get a tie. You know, I think it's four years to get to reclaim the uh, the Section four five five tax that you've already paid. You know, that the company's paid. So if you forget, HMRC is not going to come and give it to you. I just sort of want to cover timing of things. Now we've just covered loan accounts in Section four five five tax. If you repay them within nine months, there's no follow-on charge. Um, but beware bed and breakfasting. I'll cover that in a sec. Bonuses and similar. Um, many of you will be familiar with the idea that you can make a provision for a bonus um, at the end of the accounting period. Uh, you know, the company's year end. Uh, you may say, right, £10,000 bonus, £20,000 bonus, whatever it may be. Um, and it, that is deductible for corporation tax purposes, but only if paid within nine months of the year end. So you can provide for it, but you do need to make sure that it's being paid within nine months of the end of the year. Um, the thing to bear in mind with that, the trap with that one, is that you need to make sure that you haven't triggered a pay-as-you-earn obligation in making that provision. And then with dividends, they are straightforward and generally tax sufficient, but note that dividends cannot be backdated. You can't backdate a dividend. I know plenty of people who think you can, you can't. Okay, so we're gonna go into that timing thing more in a bit more detail. In, in cast your mind about two slides, either had to repay the loan within nine months after the company's year end um, in which the loan was made, or the company would have to stump up 32.5% of the tax, 32.5% uh, tax on the 50K, 16 grand that you need. To. Now, can Crafty Eva borrow from elsewhere outside the company to pay off that debt just before the trigger date, just before December 2022? Then say, oh, I don't need to pay any such well, the company doesn't need to pay any such four five five tax because I, I've I paid off the loan. And then sort of a few days later, drag the funds back out again of the company uh, to pay back the money that she's borrowed from elsewhere to, to her buddy. Uh, no. You, know, you could you could have done before Finance Act 2013. HMRC used to argue that you couldn't, uh, but legislation was introduced in Finance Act 2013. Bed and breakfasting rules. So those rules will now say that if, if Crafty Eva tries to do this, they'll say, yes, you've repaid a loan, but you've repaid the later loan. And the original loan back in April 2021 is still outstanding. That's not touched. When you, when you brought the money back in and then took it back out again and say May uh, 2022, um, we're going to match, we're going to match up the repayment that you made with the later loan leaving the original loan outstanding. However, a repayment from income that has already been taxed will repay the original loan. So if the company pays a bonus to Eva or dividends are paid to Eva and credited to her loan account, they do repay the original loan. HMRC says it has to be funds from that company that repaid the original loan. Um, that's just the way that it is. Timing as regards bonuses. Uh, time, horrendously, brilliant. Um, a bonus justifiably provided at the company's year end will be tax deductible for the company, even if not physically paid then, although it must be paid within nine months of the year end. So it's going to what we did in the, in the previous slide which sounds great, but there are several triggers and more triggers for directors to trigger a pay-as-you-earn tax charge, even if there's no physical payment. In other words, potentially, when you make the provision that might in, in the account, that might trigger a pay-as-you-earn charge. You're not intending to pay, physically pay the, the bonus until maybe six months later, eight months later, whatever. Um, just to recap these triggers, and it's the earliest of 
where this happens, when you actually put it in practice, because that's obvious, when you actually make the payment, then obviously pays are going to But if any of the following is earlier than that date of payment, then they will also trigger an earlier pays you earn tax charge. As HMRC is saying, we want, the, we want the pays you earn. So when the person becomes entitled to be paid, and if you're a director, it's when the earnings are credited in the company's accounts or records, where the amount is determined before the period ends, the period end, where the amount is determined after the period end, the date is determined. So if you get the timing and the process wrong, you could end up with a pay as you earn bill, no corporation tax relief because you're outside the nine months and you weren't watching, and you could, you could still be waiting for the actual bonus, but you've lost your sort of corporation tax relief and you, you've um, ended up with a page you weren't tax charged, but no money, which is you know far from ideal. Finally, on the on the, on the timing part, we're going to look at dividends, uh, and I, I want to try and make this pretty straightforward. Just give you the sort of headlines on this. HMRC has lengthy guidance on the point at which it accepts a dividend has been paid, and it usually sort of falls as follows: final dividends those being those which are approved by shareholders in a general meeting, it is generally the date of approval, or if you were, if the shareholders agree, say at the end, you know, at the end of June 2021, in relation to accounts to March 2021, that they will pay a dividend in August 2021, it's August 2021, if that makes sense. Interim dividends, which are far more common, they're, they're paid during the year, they're made by the directors, but interim dividends are only paid once put unreservedly at the disposal of the shareholder. Because interim dividends can generally be um, uh, recalled or cancelled at any point up to the point of actually making the payment, then you can't sort of put a a specific date on it in a way that you can with a final event. The thing to be aware of here is that HMRC's position is that if you are making a book entry to affect the dividend payment, like for instance, uh, paying a dividend of 50,000 pounds or 20,000 pounds against Eva's loan that was made in April, 2021, if you make a, uh, an adjustment in the books of the company, and that is the only sort of part, there's no physical cash being moved or paid because it's being used to offset a, a, a debt to the company, it's paid only once that book entry is made. And this happens a lot. Lots of uh, adjustments are made by book entry, particularly for owner-managed businesses, SMEs, family companies, that kind of thing. And I'm just going to say, Hopefully, that is not in a later tax year when your accountant writes up your books. Let's leave that there for you. I should add that a company's memorandum and articles might very rarely have a different set of stipulations for how uh, dividends, you know, what is required to approve a dividend, et cetera, et cetera. But that is by far and away the more common set of their final dividends approved by shareholders in a, in, a, in a general meeting, interim dividends. Approved by approved effectively, uh, paid by uh, the directors. We're going to look at exit uh, and company sale. In this section, we're going to take a, a quick look at selling to third parties, selling to employees, leaving the company in the hands of the next generation, if, if that's uh, your, your aim, liquidating the company, winding it down, and keeping it as a money box in retirement, or just working till you drop. Um, which has an, more of an inheritance tax or IHC uh, emphasis. Uh, selling to third parties, clearly you'd expect to be subject to capital gains tax, typically at 20%, but shares in a trading company will often qualify for 10% entrepreneur's relief. And I insist on calling it entrepreneur's relief only because everybody else I know still calls it entrepreneur's relief. Nobody outside of HMRC has the temerity to refer to it as business asset disposal relief. We know what it is. Um, up to a million quid over your lifetime. So it could be two sets of share sales for 500 grand of capital gain, 
or it could be three at 333, um, or it could be one for five million, and the first million pounds worth of gains is potentially covered by business as disposable. <gasps> um, now, this, such gains are only eligible if for the preceding two years you've held at least a 5% stake in the company, ignoring EMI shares. Uh, you've been an employee or officer of the company, and the company's not had any substantial non-trading activity in the company. So property businesses, tough, no entrepreneurially for you. Uh, but property development businesses, you're trading, maybe, but property investment businesses, no. If the buyer wants the company's assets instead of the shares, so the buyer coming in, you know, ideally you just want to sell the shares and walk away, whereas sometimes the buyer just wants the assets um, and is going to leave the company behind, just going to scoop up all the assets, say, I don't, I don't care about, you know, Sharp Property Construction Limited, not interested, I just want the assets. Um, the company has to sell the assets and then uh, you have to maybe dissolve the company or, or whatever. We'll go, we'll go on to uh, uh, winding up the company later on. But generally speaking, shares are easier and cheaper. Selling shares. Um, selling your shares to employees, similar to selling to third parties as above, generally speaking. So you're again looking at potentially uh, scoring entrepreneurs relief if you're a trading and otherwise eligible company, subject to the conditions of before. But it's a little bit more complicated because you need to be aware of employment related securities. Um, if you've got employees and they're, they, are, they either are or are going to be shareholders as well, then the law and HMRC in particular assumes that they've got those shares by reason of their employment. So really shares are subject to pay your earning income tax. So they have to, they will be subject to income tax as if they were earnings to the extent that the employees are not paying full whack for the shares. That's the risk, if you will. So as long as you are treating your employees the same way as you would a third party, then employment related securities is not going to get a look in. It's more to do with the fact that if you are trying or the shares are heavily discounted to try and encourage the, uh, the employees to, to take this uh, company off your hands because you're sick of it, you've had enough, you want to retire. Um, those kinds of scenarios would end up with you being potentially exposed or, with there being an income tax charge as far as the employees were concerned, uh, which might make it less palatable. An alternative is an employee ownership trust. And I did touch on this in, in the previous webinar. Um, I emphasize it's, if it works, it's CGT free. So there's no capital gains tax and it is a, a disposal at full market value. So you, the, the company at least owes you for your shares. Oh, the trust does. But, um, but the, the sort of flip side of this and why it will not be palatable for some is that as part of the qualification process for an employee ownership trust for it to be valid, uh, the surviving or remaining family involvement must be restricted. They cannot control the company going forwards. Now, an alternative to selling your shares to your employees is a company purchase of own shares, which we will look at uh, next. Okay, leaving or selling up to the next generation. Uh, it's similar to selling to employees generally, and you, you could potentially get 10% ER entrepreneurs relief or business asset reserve relief. Uh, share transactions in the, in the course of normal family arrangements uh, can avoid the worst of employment-related security. So if, you're, uh, if you were going to give uh, the shares to your son or daughter just because they're family, then actually employment-related securities may not bite. An alternative is consider selling shares back to the company instead. Now, I'll pitch this scene. Um, you own... 50 of the shares, 50 out of 100 shares in your company. Your daughter owns 50 of the shares in your company. Uh, your daughter can't afford to buy the shares from you. The company is sitting on a pile of cash. Uh, so you sell the shares to the company instead. Surprisingly, even though the daughter has only 50 shares, she now owns 
all of the company because you don't own it anymore. So it, it, it works, it's an alternate route, but it's, it, it, you end up in the same place. Having said that, company purchases of own shares, the rules are more stringent than the entrepreneurs relief, business assets of relief uh, share, uh, conditions that we've, we've already discussed. And careful planning is, is essential and clearance, pre-transaction clearance is strongly recommended. Must be a trading company, must have held the shares for at least five years, there must be a significant reduction in your holding. Uh, you can't be left with anything more than a token holding in the company when you leave. Um, and most importantly, you've got to be able to demonstrate that that company purchase of own shares benefits the business, benefits the company, benefits the trade. There's got to be a, a commercial motivation behind it. It's not just, I want to retire, I want to get out, and I, I, you know, I want to sell the shares and, and uh, get capital gains tax treatment. Now, liquidating the company is a bit like selling your shares back to the company. Uh, the company usually sells all its own assets for cash and then pays out to the shareholders. By default, a company distribution of its cash wealth will be an income distribution, a dividend, unless a liquidator is appointed. So if your company is, is sizable, then factor in the cost of liquidator to make sure that you get the cheaper tax-wise or more, more tax-efficient capital route. Even then, CGT is potentially at risk from the anti-phoenixing regime to retrospectively turn the payments back into dividends if you're involved with a similar business afterwards, but don't have a good commercial reason for the liquidation. Generally speaking, if you're doing, uh, if you're winding up a company for a valid non-tax reason, then you'll be okay. That's what HMRC says anyway. Winding down, I touched on this a couple of months back. Uh, you keep the company on, you keep the shares, cease the business, the company sells its assets, the company sits on a load of cash, and then pays out dividends to you over a number of years to top up your pension. Say, bear in mind that if we're talking about retirement, then you will be in a much more favorable position income tax wise. You won't be sort of earning salaries of hundred thousand pounds and taking company cars and whatever to top, you know, to uh, to make your assessable uh, income or deemed income substantial. Um, it may just be a modest pension that you're able to top up and, and take quite tax efficiently. Now, if you're going to sort of carry on in harness till you drop, then uh, you want to be looking at the inheritance tax aspects. Business property relief is what you're looking for. Trading companies in unquoted shares held for at least two years, they will get business property relief. Look out for investment, non-trading activity in the company or substantial cash balances. You can't shelter um, <laughs> a huge amount of wealth, millions of pounds in, in the company's bank account, just sitting there doing nothing and saying, uh, I've got no assets. Uh, just uh, All I have is 100 shares in my trading company. Uh, window cleaning business sitting on five million pounds of, of cash doesn't work. Uh, they're accepted assets or the, the, the cash balance would be accepted assets. Um, also beware uh, assets held outside the company. The company shares get 100% business property relief if they hit all the criteria. Uh, but any assets held outside the company will only qualify for 50% if they qualify at all. Just mention um, agricultural property relief as an alternative to BPR. Uh, but it protects only the agricultural value of the land, grazing land, that kind of thing. So it tends to be much less than market value. What have we learned? Under no circumstances should you try and do more than 30 slides in an hour. <laughs> Disaster awaits. Um, incorporation is not for everyone or every business, particularly with higher corporation tax looming on the horizon, we're at 1st of April 2023. However, they still offer legal protection advantages and tax efficiencies in a range of situations. Just need to do your maths and need to tailor that, those mathematical calculations to consider whether there's more than one shareholder, more than one company. Back to the good old days of associated companies, et cetera, et cetera. The timing of borrowings, bonuses, and dividends all have important things, aspects that can trip you up, triggering section 455 tax on direct loans, pay as you earn on bonus provisions, or updating the company's books at the right time. The right types of benefits, benefits in kind, 
can still be quite tax efficient. Do the math, set them up properly uh, and take the benefit of the benefits. Uh, there are lots of ways to exit a company and lots of ways to trigger a tax charge or the wrong tax charge. You thought it was capital gains tax, now it's income tax. Okay, with almost no time left, Q&As, tax tip for company directors. David, are there any tax implications where the company repays a substantial loan received from the director when it was set up? It appears to me to be a balance sheet, double-sided entry, zero. David, no immediate consequences that I can think of when a company repays a loan to you. Uh, there could be inheritance tax implications in the longer term, depending on what you decide then to do with the cash. If the company still say, you know, if, if the, the company's value will increase once the loan's gone. Um, and if that loan, if, if that company rather is later eligible for inheritance tax, BPR, or capital gains tax on entrepreneurs relief, that could be good. Just what are you going to do with the, with the cash that's now in your sort of personal mitts? Uh, Lawrence, I am expanding. Uh, Lawrence, Lawrence is expanding his operation overseas. Uh, do they need to be funded through the director's loan account as advised by my accountant? And he's, your accountant's kind of giving you some sort of references. The fundamental question here is, and it, it, from the two lines you've given, I don't have enough info. So I'm saying it's an interesting situation. Lawrence, you may wish to pause the uh, webinar at this stage to give you the chance to read all this. Um, th there are questions behind the questions. But fundamentally, and this is something that I see accountants get wrong time and time again, saying that something is not tax deductible is not the same as saying that it's a benefit in kind. Saying that something is not taxable, uh, tax deductible because it's uh, capital, it, it's not saying, oh, it must now be assessable on you as an individual, you've got to pay tax on it. And, and I see this happen time and time again. Uh, you know, if you're expanding an existing trade or business, why is that capital? You know, there may, you know, you might be going out to, to, to consider buying premises in Bulgaria or something like that, in which case, you know, viewing premises or potential premises might be capital. But no, there are some, I have questions. I have questions. I, I can't answer it, but um, I have significant doubts as to the treatment that's being proposed. Having said that, I've only got a couple of lines to work with. There could be very good reasons that I'm not aware of. Uh, and even more of a question from why. Um, only shall the director, uh, uh, why you need to pause this uh, on, on replay because you're obviously going to watch it again and again. Um, I can't see any avoidance. You're not avoiding anything. You, 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 you're hitting capital gains tax. You just not. You don't need to pay it. It, there's IHT, it's a, it's a potentially exempt transfer. Um, the only thing that you haven't touched on is employment related securities, but again, may not buy in these circumstances. Debbie, do you have any views on the hybrid model? Mixed partnership, both income tax and IHT planning. Debbie, yes, I do. They're complicated. Assuming we're talking about mixed membership partnerships, then please feel free to look at Waleski at the first tier and upper tier tribunals, first tier and upper tribunals, they should be of significant interest to you. Patrick, can you provide me with a full breakdown as to how Alphabet shares work? And also where I can find books demonstrating examples of how they work in real life. Patrick, no. You need to speak to a very amenable corporate lawyer. They will be able to tell you all about Alphabet shares. Uh, please do let me know if and when you find such a rare piece. Joanna, I have one question. Joanna, there are two questions there. I can see them straight away. Uh, I was hoping you could give me some direction. My dad is having a commercial property and the company, which is, I think what you're trying to tell me is that dad has a property in a company and he could either arrange for the company to sell the property and then distribute out the cash, or he could give the shares. Uh, to the next generation, and, and both are sort of potentially valid. Um, it, it's not clear, but the, I think the key issue here is whether or not this is a, a valuable asset and an appreciating asset in the long term. If it's an asset that you want to keep, if it makes sense to keep this commercial property, 
for the, you know, for the longer and longer term, then why sell it? Why not just move the shares? I accept there may be CGT, but do it over time. You're allowed to do that. You know, you don't have to give all the shares away straight away. Use your annual exemption. Maybe if, uh, if there's a spouse or civil partner involved, move some shares to the spouse or civil partner. That's always CGT free or almost always CGT free. Do check. Um, and then both of you could use your own exemptions over the next 10, 15 years. Inheritance tax is also potentially in point, but not necessarily due now, because if you're giving away cash, individual to individual, if you're giving away shares, individual to individual during one's lifetime, that's a potential exempt transfer, provided the disponer survives the gift by seven years, it should be exempt. And that's it. 